Thank you. And so before starting this presentation, I disclose I'm a member of the Medical Advisory Board of Pulchin Medical Systems. Which monitoring tool should we use in our ARDS patients? In fact, the question is difficult. But I think that the first question we should ask is not which monitoring tool we should use, but should we monitor cardiac output in these patients? I mean, in such complex patients, do we need to monitor cardiac output or can we rely on the only arterial pressure, the simple arterial pressure, to monitor these patients? Today, there are some data to say that no, we need to monitor so severe patients. A few years ago, with Jean-Louis Teboul, we conducted this study. We included two populations of patients. In this one, these patients received volume expansion, meaning there was no change in systemic vascular resistance, no change in the relationship between stroke volume and pulse pressure, while the other population there is an increase in the dose of norepinephrine. And look at the results here. In patients who received volume expansion, there was a rough relationship between pulse pressure and cardiac index. While in patients where we increased norepinephrine, there is no correlation anymore. Meaning that in these patients, it is not possible, definitely not possible, to rely on arterial pressure to monitor the changes in cardiac output. In these patients who receive vasopressors, we need to directly measure cardiac output. And we confirmed this result, and this study will present this afternoon with uh, uh, Zakaria Aitamu. And we show that the changes in pulse pressure are not able to detect the changes in cardiac index induced by volume expansion with no discrimination between responders and non-responders if we want a precise hemodynamic monitoring, we must again directly monitor cardiac output. And by the way, in this uh, recent consensus of the European Society, you see that it's clearly recommended that cardiac output and stroke volume should be monitored to evaluate the response to fluids and inotropes in patients who do not respond to initial therapy, meaning patients who receive vasopressors. And I think it's one of the important messages that we must uh, keep in mind. Then the second question is logically, which of these monitoring devices uh, do we actually need? In fact, all the devices are definitely not the same. First of all, the old uh, esophageal Doppler is uh, not very convenient to use in the ICU. We should forget it. There are some more modern, more recent devices that have the advantage of being totally non-invasive I think that today these devices are not reliable enough in our ICU patients. Then we are left with the uncalibrated pulse control analysis devices with transpulmonary thermal lotion devices, EV1000 and PICO, and with the old PA catheter. What about the reliability between all these devices? And again, it's not the same. And especially, many studies showed that the uncalibrated devices are not reliable to detect the changes in cardiac output in patients who receive vasopressors again. It's shown by many studies. For instance, in this one, you see that the changes in cardiac output induced by volume expansion were roughly followed by the Vigilo, while it was not the case in patients where we increased the dose of norepinephrine. Again, these uncalibrated pulse control analysis devices are not suitable for the ICU patients. They are more OR devices. So we are left with the transpulmonary thermal lotion devices and the PA catheter, the most invasive but also the most informative uh, devices. The uncalibrated pulse control analysis is not reliable in patients receiving vasopressors. It should not be used in uh, ARDS patients. But then, which of the last devices should we use to exactly answer the question of this talk to detect the hemodynamic effects of mechanical ventilation? I think a good way to answer is to ask another question. What are these effects? What's the pattern of the hemodynamic uh, consequences of, um, of mechanical ventilation? Let's go back to the pathophysiology that Armand uh, explained before. In fact, mechanical ventilation influences circulation by increases two different pressures, the intrathoracic pressure and the transpulmonary pressure. 
the intrathoracic pressure is the pressure that surrounds the cardiac cavities, meaning that when it increases, it increases the right atrial pressure, it reduces the pressure gradient of venous return, it decreases cardiac preload. And if the patient is preload dependent, then this may lead to a decrease in cardiac index. On the other side, the transpulmonary pressure is the distending pressure of the lung, meaning that if it increases, it stretches some pulmonary vessels, reducing their diameter and leading to a significant increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance and in the right ventricular afterload. This may directly reduce cardiac index and also indirectly, as explained by Armand before, through the RV dilation that may compress the left ventricle and reduce its compliance. What can be seen here is that, in fact, the pattern of the hemodynamic alterations induced by mechanical ventilation is made of right atrial pressure increase, preload dependence, right ventricular dilation, a decrease in cardiac output, and an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. This is what we should detect with our hemodynamic monitoring. How do both uh, categories of devices detect these, uh, all these abnormalities? Of course, both systems are able to detect the changes in right atrial pressure. That's not very difficult. It's more difficult and more tricky for the preload dependence. You know, we have several tests today to assess uh, the um, preload dependence. But here the point, the first important point, is that we must bear in mind that <clears throat> pulse pressure, stroke volume variation, and the changes in vena cavall diameter are not reliable in ARDS patients because of the low tidal volume and of the low lung compliance. It's been shown for false pressure variations years ago by Daniel de Becker. You see that if tidal volume is low, then the area under the rocker for pulse pressure variation is low as well. It's not only the tidal volume, but also the rigidity of the lungs and we showed in this study that the lower the compliance of the respiratory system, the lower the area under the rack curve and the ability of PPV to detect preload responsiveness. So it means that we must rely on the two last uh, tests, passive leg raising and expiratory occlusion. And here regarding the question we're asking about choosing hemodynamic uh, monitoring device, what's important to bear in mind is that these tests both require a real-time monitoring of cardiac output. What do I mean? For instance, with the, the end expiratory occlusion test, perhaps you've heard about this test we developed a few years ago. It's based on handling interactions. As we have seen before, in a patient with mechanical ventilation, each insufflation decreases the, outer, the cardiac preload. Meaning that if we stop mechanical ventilation at end expiration, then we stop the cyclic impediment in cardiac preload. We allow the cardiac preload to increase for a few seconds. And if the patient is preload dependent, then cardiac output may increase, should increase. <laughs> this is at least what we showed uh, uh, in uh, 2009 in this study. If cardiac output increased by more than 5% during a 15 second and expiratory occlusion, the patient was preload responsive. And uh, a few years later, we showed that the test can be used in ARDS patients because you see that the area under the rack curve was the same at 5 or 15 <laughs> centimeters of water of PEEP level. But the point here is that for this test, we need a direct and real-time measurement of cardiac output. Look at the example here. We stop mechanical ventilation. I'm sorry, could you? Anyway. Uh, the change in uh, 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 ventilation induces changes in, uh, and even here it doesn't work, I'm sorry, the change in cardiac index that occurs from, uh, that changes from second to second. To monitor such short-term changes, re you need a real-time monitoring of cardiac output. For instance, here, calibrated pulse control analysis. It's not possible to use the PA catheter to monitor these changes. And it's the same here for the, uh, the passive leg raising. Yes, the test is reliable, as we showed in the meta-analysis here. But with a real-time measurement of cardiac output, and the same here for the test, I don't know if uh, this will work here, you see that the test induces 
short-term changes in cardiac output, you must have a real-time, continuous measurement of cardiac output. And I think it's actually a key question when we choose between the monitoring devices. They require a real-time measurement of cardiac output, and I think it's one of the main drawbacks today of the PA catheter. What about the pulmonary vascular resistance and the right ventricular dilation? And here there is, there is absolutely no doubt. Echocardiography is the gold standard to detect right ventricular dilation because it allows, as showed by the previous speakers, the direct visualization of the right ventricle. But you know the problem with echo? It's that it's not a monitoring device. I mean, in a patient with ARDS, how many echoes are you going to perform in one day? Likely not more than one or two. It means that we need something that allows us a more rapid and easier and uh, more convenient way to detect the right ventricular failure. Could it be with the other devices, PA catheter and the transpulmonary thermodilation devices, since we need them? The PA catheter has the unique advantage of monitoring directly the pulmonary vascular resistance, and it's the only device that allows this monitoring. Of course, if it increases, if cardiac index decreases, then you must suspect that there is a right ventricular dilation and perform echocardiography. Transpulmonary thermodilation doesn't measure the pulmonary vascular resistance, but it may detect the right ventricular dilation. Why? Because with transpulmonary thermodilation, you can assess the volume of the four cardiac chambers at end diastole. And so if it increases again, you can suspect there is a right ventricular dilation and perform echocardiography. One device that directly measures the pulmonary vascular resistance, the other one that allows an easy detection of the right ventricular dilation and the advantage also, in my eyes, it's not the topic today, of a transpulmonary thermodilation is that it allows you to measure lung water and to directly assess the risk of fluid administration. So the PA catheter measures the pulmonary vascular resistance while transpulmonary thermodilation detects the right ventricular dilation and assesses directly the risk of fluid administration. And by the way, you see that the uh, consensus I quoted before actually uh, suggested and recommended to use the transpulmonary thermodilation and the pulmonary artery catheter to monitor patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we can say in conclusion then in practice I think that we should use either the pulmonary artery catheter or the PICO and EV1000 devices to monitor cardiac output, also to guide fluid therapy and use them also to detect the right ventricular failure as I showed before. We should also use echo that is absolutely mandatory in these patients at least once a day and also of course if we detect the right ventricular failure. I think it's the most reasonable way today to perform in these patients with ERDS. Thank you very much for your attention.